Well, good morning, everybody. Um, we're just a tick over 11 a.m. Um, and uh, for those of you joining us, I just wanted to highlight that we do have two Auslan um, uh, signers with us today. I will spotlight Brooke Tapia now, and you can pin her to your screen. Um, if you like, you can do that yourself by clicking on the three dots in the right hand corner of your screen and clicking pin video. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll leave it here for you um, and you can move it back to gallery view if that suits you better. Um, Brooke will also be uh, interchanging with Christine McDougall. Um, so feel free to pin Christine McDougall's screen up as well. Um, we do have closed captions in this Zoom meeting. Um, so uh, you can see those happening as well. Now that we've got that little bit out of the way, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Christy McBain and I'm the Labor candidate for the Eden Monero election on the 4th of July. Uh, coming up quickly now. Um, can I commence today's meeting by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands and waters of our Shire? Well, this electorate, but where I am at the moment in the Bega Valley is the Ewan people uh, and pay my respect to elders past and present. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, the National Disability Insurance Scheme is coming up to its seventh birthday in July this year. So I thought it would be a good idea to come together uh, and share your experiences with the NDIS and ask some questions about it. Uh, in 2008, half of people with severe and permanent disabilities were getting little uh, or no support, half. The old system of disability uh, support in Australia was broken. And the truth is people with disabilities, their carers and families were treated like second class citizens. And together with the disability community and groups like Every Australian Counts, uh, the Labor Party campaigned for a national disability insurance scheme. Uh, it was Labor Prime Minister Julia Gillard, uh, Jenny Macklin, and my guest today, Bill Shorten, that pushed for it to be implemented, and we now have the NDIS system. Unfortunately, some of that enthusiasm and excitement about the NDIS has turned to frustration, and for some people, disappointment in recent years. I know that many people with disabilities are frustrated with their NDIS plans, and in particular, the review process. Uh, and they continue to be frustrated by the lack of suitable housing. I'm very interested to talk with Bill today and listen to your questions and queries. Just before we jump into that though, there's a few housekeeping uh, uh, issues that I'll just let you know about. So this meeting is being recorded. Be relaxed and respectful. Um, we encourage you to keep your video on. Uh, we've found it really does add uh, to the sense of uh, being together that Zoom facilitates. If you're on a computer or a laptop, uh, you can set your screen to gallery view, as I said, by clicking uh, the button in the top right hand corner. There is a chat function that will allow you to ask questions or make a comment. Uh, and we welcome you to introduce yourself so we know who is in the room uh, when you're asking your question or comment. Uh, if you're not able to use the chat function, you can use the raise your hand feature, which is, should be down the bottom of your screen. Everyone is muted. Uh, an admin will unmute you if you're called on during the Q&A. Um, but we will have to uh, uh, accept the unmuting before that can be done. We encourage you to use your full names, uh, the, op uh, the organisation you're representing uh, in uh, that introduction. Um, or you can rename yourself um, in this view. Uh, again, you click on the, the three dots at the top right hand uh, of your screen and you can rename yourself if you need to do that. Um, before we jump into the questions though, we'll hand over to Bill, uh, my special guest today. Bill, tell us a bit about your involvement in the NDIS. Thanks, Christy, and thank you everybody for catching up with Christy and I today. The NDIS is really important. It's not all the disability issues, but it's a, it is really important. I, when I got elected to parliament the, uh, in 2008, actually at the same time that uh, Mike Kelly ran, um, I got the chance to be the junior minister for uh, disability. And even though as a union rep, I'd seen unfairness, nothing prepared me for uh, 
systemic entrenched unfairness if, that Australians with disability and their families, carers live with. So we agitated, we organised with the community, as uh, Christy said, with uh, the Every Person Counts with carers. I remember visiting parts of uh, the Vega Valley even as before the NDIS was developed. Uh, and we got the NDIS. Now what's happened in the last seven years is it's rolled out. I've become concerned, Christy, that there's a lot of red tape, a lot of complexity, uh, a lot of one size fits all. It was about giving people choice and control, but it seems sometimes people's plans are evaluated on the basis of reasonable and necessary and not choice and control. I think we can rescue the NDIS, uh, but I do think it needs improvement. For some people, it's been fantastic. For other people, it's almost become a second full-time job just doing the paperwork. And there are particular needs in your electorate Christy, of uh, remoteness, services, um, you know, the price list, transport. I think we can improve it. We've started to make some improvements in this term of opposition. Uh, but of course, we don't want the federal government to raid the NDIS. I mean, they have an underspend, but that's because it's hard to uh, get approvals. And if you don't spend your package, then what happens is the next year it gets taken away from you, the proportion you haven't spent. So. I think there are anxieties, there are legitimate concerns about uh, care and attention. But one thing I just wanted to say in finishing to all of the people here is we're very fortunate to have Christy as one of the candidates uh, running in the election, of course, as the Labor flag bearer. She's been uh, involved with Bega Shire and Bega Shire actually provides the NDIS services because they understand that you know, so there's thin markets and a, a, a lack of service provision from other organisations. So we're very fortunate to have someone who's so NDIS savvy as the candidate. And I think that's yet another good reason to uh, support her on July the 4th. But why don't we just hear how people are going, what they're thinking, I'll do less talking, I'm interested for you to do as much as you want. And you know, I, it's not about just questions, it's about statements. You can always turn your statement into a question saying, do we agree at the end of your statement? But we're here to listen and to uh, take up any issues. Yeah, thanks, Bill. And I think you've highlighted uh, definitely the experience of many people across the Monero. Um, there are few private providers um, because not all of the aspects of NDIS are, are profitable for private providers. So we do have uh, some councils providing some of those services across different areas of the Eden Monero. But the thing we hear off quite often is that the paperwork is so complex for people and we're having um, far too many people wasting time on paperwork, which seems to, yeah. to not only be the case in this NDIS, it's also the case in bushfire recovery as well. And, you know, we just can't have people that, that have genuine needs wasting time on paperwork. There has to be a better way to do it. Um, all right, we'll get you guys, if there are any questions, you can either use the, the raise your hand function or submit it in the chat. Um, is there, does there anyone have an experience they wish to, to share first off? Um, now, Miss Redmond's put up her hand. I don't know what your first name is. Um, there we go. Unmute. Um, look, um, I'm I'm really quite anxious at the present time because we've got adults in our services who have profound physical disabilities. It's a very specialised Nardi House. So it's I'm sorry, it's Denise Redmond. I'm the CEO of Nardi House, and Nardi House is at um, Huama in New South Wales, far south coast, in your electorate. So that's what this is all about. Um, we've had three adults whose plans have taken seven months to review. From the outset, the plans were not done effectively. There were very specific requests made within the plans for plan management of therapy services. Now, the reason why we wanted to plan manage those therapy services was because it's really difficult in this area to get therapists. So we needed, we couldn't get NDIS therapists, so we were hiring, we needed to hire therapists and therefore we needed to pay them. So what we wanted to, to do was simply plan manage that aspect of the plan, which we thought was a pretty simple request. 
but that proves not to be the case. What, what ended up happening was that the whole plans were handed over to plan management, not one aspect of the plans. We wanted NDIS to hold the funds. The reason why we wanted that was so there was complete transparency and so there was complete accountability related to that to their money, you know. So, so that was the first aspect. The second aspect was each of our adult individuals require nursing care each and every day. One, one um, participant, for example, requires four hours of nursing per day. And in the planner's assessment, they got four hours of nursing per year. So that happened with the, in each and every adult case. So we were, we, they had been having nursing services in the past. The nursing services were meant to continue. They live at the house. The nurse, we, we have 24 hour, seven day a week nursing and the costs of nursing provision were not being covered at all. Some of the um, clients, their planner judged, didn't need nursing at all. And, and so what happened was we asked for a review of the plan. The plan is only, the plans have only recently been reviewed and re-released. This is seven months later. And, and I don't know now, even though the plans have been released and I have all permissions to undertake all negotiations with NDIS. I have not seen the plans before they have been re-released. -re so I haven't seen the draft, so I don't know what nursing hours are involved. And the problem is, if the nursing hours are withdrawn, then someone still has to do that services. So a disability support worker has to do those services and they have to be supervised by a nurse. We're talking about enemas, we're talking about medications. We are not talking about unskilled work. Now, my, my question is, how is the nurses union going to cope with this undermining and de-skilling of their profession by um, disability support workers who have a scope of practice that is limited to an online course? Uh, you know, we cannot, we cannot, I don't think we can train our nurses, uh, our DSWs to take the roles of a nurse. It's not possible. And the other thing too, you know, when you're talking about, let's take a, a skilled example of enema. We have people, as I said, with profound physical disabilities, they're genetic disabilities in, in many cases, and that means that their bowel is not a regular bowel. We are going to end up with, with perforated bowels, not because people aren't trying to do the right thing, but because um, we don't have skilling. So it's a problem and it's a Labor problem and it's a Labor Party problem and it's a union problem as well. So it, this is a massive problem that's being created and the argument is being put that DSWs can do the work of nurses, and I would argue they can't. Um, Christy, do you, would you like me to make some... Yeah, that'd be great, Bill, if you'd like to answer that. Um, well, I think I've got all the answers. Nice to see you, Denise. Um, you are indefatigable. Uh, I think we, we visited earlier in this year, if you recall, uh, and also I think we visited back 10 years ago, you haven't given up. I'm glad that the SIL packages have had some progress, but you're quite right. I think there's an issue of cost cutting somewhere lurking behind this work practice issue. You're quite right. Uh, nurses should do uh, this work. It frustrates me to hear that the NDIA or people are still arguing with you about the nursing hour component of it. So we're just going to have to hassle. I might be tempted to almost uh, so we've got to escalate this to the minister and the next three weeks is a pretty good time to escalate this issue, Denise. But the longer term issue, we should, what is the price guide saying to you? Are they, are they sort of just, do you think it's a price driven argument they're trying to do? They're just not? Look, look I, I think it's related to um, 
it's related to high level needs. I'm pretty mm. sure that in these new plans, the nursing component will be there. Mm. But what won't, what, what then, the, the next argument will be, what's happened between October when their plans were due and June when their plans are reviewed to the nursing component when the service is already given? There's going to have to be a manual payout of some sort from NDIS. And NDIS seems incapable of making those sort of, of payments. It's, it's as if, it's as if um, there's a blockage there. There's no simple resolution. The simple resolution would have been back in October when, when the plans were first done for a review to be done immediately because they were incorrect. There were direct requests made that were ignored and the RN factor was ignored. It had been, you know, this has been going on for four years. This is not something new. This is a battle we've had every year. And in our first year, many years ago, we had the acting director of the Southern Region come to Nardi House and allocate the nursing hours. He sat there. He saw our participants, he, he recognised the need, and then he went, right, this is the way we can do this. And that was implemented, and then it was, it was changed and modified. Then SIL came in, then it was somehow infiltrated into SIL, and, and now we're in the situation, I've known all along that it should have been a separate line item because that's the way it was initially done, and that's where it should have sat. And that's been a problem for a very long time for us. So high level needs are, um, you know, getting the short end of the stick. So here. what we'll do, um, uh, Denise, is uh, make some representations on um, behalf of Nardi House. And um, you guys have been through a particularly tough start to the year, obviously, with your with your evacuations because of bushfire, which obviously added some, some pressure um, uh, to some of your uh, residents there as well. So um, we'll go on to the, the, the next question. We've got um, Kim who had her hand up, then we'll go to Lisa Miller-Bradley, Lynn Kerbin, and then Karen Mills. So uh, to Kim first. Yeah, hi, I've just got a question around, um, the mental health aspect of the NDIS. And that is our um, hospital, when people are discharged with um, multiple diagnosis, aren't being sort of turned in the right area to look at NDIS packages and stuff. So maybe 20% of the people that were getting services before in our area are now missing out on services because they don't know how to implement and access them. Yeah, thanks, Kim. I think um, uh, we're hearing many things, especially in that mental health space, um, about uh, how it's dealt with, particularly in the, the hospitals, um, and then how the referral services work from the hospital after you present there. Uh, and in many cases, um, the services that should have been implemented before you presented at the hospital in the first place. Um, uh, so, yeah, really interesting to, to hear that. Bill, do you have anything to add on how we get these people that uh, present to hospitals for, for mental health care uh, onto the NDIS if they're not on it beforehand? Well, there's two issues. One is, and it's also the same problem that Denise talks about, NDIS doesn't understand, in my opinion, um, a whole range of the impairments. So complex needs, I think it struggles with. They've had to set up, and I think the same with mental health. Um, and I think some of the planners, with respect to them, um, some are very good, but it's a bit of a planner lottery. And some may have been selling Telstra phones a month ago, and then all of a sudden they're trying to assess a mental health claim or complex needs. So we think there is a lot of people who've fallen between the cracks. It's, it's probably the area of the largest number of people who've fallen beneath the cracks. Um, I've, one thing which I know Labor's been pushing for in the health portfolio is more mental health care visits, being able to at least get some support for mental health care plans, not capping it at 10. Um, I think, and this is a personal view at this stage, it's not policy yet, but they need to set up mental health teams within uh, uh, geographic areas of the NDIA so that if there's someone who's got an application for a package, you're being assessed by some people 
who actually know mental health. Um, and that's, I think that that extends beyond mental health though. Complex needs, there's a number of functional impairments, which in my opinion require, you know, there's, there's a sufficient number of Australians who have these conditions that the NDI could afford to develop more specialization and assessment. The other thing which we should do is just make decisions quicker and make decisions in writing because I think there's a lot of inconsistency. You can get, someone can get a package and someone else with a similar uh, diagnosis and set of circumstances doesn't. So I think that the lack of transparency in decision-making uh, and the lack of timeliness in decision-making makes it very unfair on the consumer and gives all the power to the agency. That's not a full answer, Kim, I get it. We need to also guard against the fact that the NDIS, we don't want to see money cut from the NDIS to pay for other things. Yeah, 100%, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Bill. Timeliness is um, one of the biggest issues in the implementation of NDIS for many people right across the Eden Monero. Um, we're now going to Lisa Miller-Bradley from Talgeen. Good morning. Thank you both, Bill and Christy, for the opportunity. Firstly, please let me extend my apologies on behalf of our CEO, Jen Russell. She's taking a very well-earned day off today. Otherwise, she would be um, part of this discussion. Thanks again for the opportunity to uh, participate. We have prepared uh, a list of issues of our concern and we're happy to email that after this forum. But I just thought I'd mention the top two. As you well know, Christy, Tolgeen has been enabling people with disability to live, work, play, grow in the Bega Valley for over 40 years now. We're a grassroots organisation, but relatively small in the marketplace. Our concern is that NDIS funding seems to be reducing red tape and compliance increasing to the detriment of us being able to provide services to promote choice and control for our clients with disability. We're worried that our relatively small regional service will be unable to survive in competition with the larger statewide services. It's not a, a quick answer. I'm not even sure if there is an answer. I'm just expressing concern about that. We, we feel that we are a, provide a vital service in the Bega Valley. And we're, to be honest, we're worried about um, the sustainability of our organisation. Thanks, Lisa. Be really pleased to get your email on those issues for Talgeen. Um, Talgeen do provide uh, amazing services right across uh, the Bega Valley, um, down this end of the Eden Monero electorate. Um, and in many cases, we're hearing that same story over and over again, is that um, our providers are spending far too much time and money on the admin side of things and less time and money actually employing people to provide the services to the clients. So. Um, thanks for, for that. Um, Bill, do you have anything to say on that one? Uh, I'm happy, if you like, Christy, to sort of answer at a bundle of them after people have contributed. That way we get more participation, but I certainly will come to your points, Lisa. Um, Lynn, did you have a question? Lynn Kerbin. Got a mute. Yep. Uh, there it is. <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, one of our observations is about behaviour support. So we work, um, many of our, the people we support have intellectual disabilities and spectrum disorders and uh, sometimes uh, the way they communicate is through their behaviour and uh, it, it helps uh, when we can have good clinical support with them. Uh, and behaviour support plans and good access to speech pathologists to help with their communication. But we're finding more and more that the NDIS doesn't build in enough funding in the behaviour support category, the relationships category. Uh, so we had an example, for instance, in um, the Urubadala of a client who um, was moving into some supported uh, accommodation, had an existing behaviour support plan, needed review. The planners were obviously aware of it but didn't put any funding for 
to support that review or to support a practitioner to be um, working with the client, the client's family or the client's support staff to, to make sure he could participate in activities to the best of his abilities. So it's really frustrating. It's not an isolated case. We see it again and ag again and again. You know, they might have 10 hours of behaviour support um, where even their assessment might take eight hours by the time you actually meet and really delve into what's going on for for a client. So I could see Mitch nodding because Mitch, you work in this space as well. Um, yeah, so it's, it is an ongoing frustration about, it touches on Denise's comments as well about planners really listening and, and um, having capacity to reflect what the client's needs are in the plans. So my question is, how do we influence that? How do we get a better, um, not so much focus on the, the dollars, but actually a focus on the outcomes for our, our people? Uh, I, I, I did say I'd wait to other things, but I've got an easy answer to that. You vote for Christy, because we've got to get more people. Uh, you might expect me to say this, but I believe it fundamentally. I think there's a lot of people on all sides of politics very committed to disability and, and but we get it in a way which I don't think the, the, the blue team get it at the moment. So if you want to get more support and more empathy, because I think empathy is an important part of this. If you want an organisation which is responsive to people, not making but covering decisions and going through matrixes and just justifying their own whatever plans internally they've got, just vote for Christy. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Lynn. Um, I've got a question here from Kirsten Cook and I'll read it out. It said, I am a mother of two children participants. One of my uh, children gets a review with the planner and we've received two great plans by this. My other child has reviews via LAC and these have been disasters. Why can't reviews be done by planners and cut out LACs? In our most recent review with the LAC, the most talked about issue was ignored by the planner. How can this be improved? Bill, I'll hand over to you on that one. Well, some of us will do this and then Lisa's point. Um, well, I think that we need to do more. Okay, it all comes back to workforce. Workforce, workforce, workforce. I've met with the NDI, I haven't had a lot of meetings directly with them, but obviously I follow it like a hawk. Um, and they haven't seen workforce planning within the disability sector as something which they need to think about. But there's a shortage of workforce right through to, you know, Auslan interpreters, right through to disability workers, right through to psychologists who are familiar with disability. And, you know, there, there is a shortage. And also with the planners, there's, as I said in an earlier answer, some planners are fantastic. Others are just so new to the sector that you wonder if they know what they're, they're just, they're not equipped. So a lot of the issues, and it goes to a point Lynn was making earlier, one of the big changes is we have to treat the development of workforce as a major priority. I mean, a lot of effort goes into their price guide. Like they're slow, they've got 962 items in their price guide. You guys should be running Woolworths. But the point about it is, um, You've got to get the workforce. The second thing is the decisions have to be, there's got to be a, a, a set of written decisions because otherwise it's just, it really is a lottery. Um, so I think they're two big issues there and you're identifying in your experience, Christine, you know, two children, but, but significantly different, uh, significantly different experiences. Like that's crazy. That's not, that's not sensible, is it? Um, so I think that the development of planners and um, consistent decision making and timely decision making, at least you know where you stand and you can appeal it if you don't like it. But when you're just kept in limbo or when there's a big churn, I think there should be more full-time staff in the NDI. I think the staff cap's ridiculous. Um, they've, they're moving to 3,800 staff in the NDIA, but they've moved from 70,000 participants to 350,000 participants. Like, you need, you can't just use contract labour for all of these positions. People, you, otherwise what happens is from one year to the next year, you don't have any consistency in the people you're dealing with. Um, Lisa was mentioning some of the challenges of smaller providers, but there should be no reason why this government's sitting on invoices. I mean, some invoices get through the system where you just think they're just shonky, but you've got other providers with track records and effectively we found out uh, at one of our estimates hearings we were in the Senate we get to ask questions 
that um, they were sitting on $150 million worth of invoices. It's not up to disability organisations to underwrite the NDIS. Also, I'm concerned that the price guide doesn't fully get regional experience. Um, we campaigned successfully, and Alicia Payne, one of our camera members, was instrumental in this, to get transport costs to be part of core supports. And, you know, that, that was a breakthrough, and I think we can make more breakthroughs. I think there are members of the government on their backbench in Parliament who would agree with everything we're saying, by the way. Um, so I think we can make some progress on that. Um, I'm also concerned that with this red tape, accreditation and registration aren't worth it for some operations. Um, and that, that worries me that it becomes a scale game where the bigger you are, the more you can flatten prices. And that, that's okay, that's economics, but uh, it's unfair then on regional areas where there's already thin markets or some of the grassroots organisations and they need more support to transfer. Um, also, the other thing which I think must be sending people into despair is the IT portal works well sometimes, but other times it's almost like they're shoving everything back onto you to fill in. Then when you fill it in, you give it back and you, you, you might have a meeting with a planner. Then you get a plan which is as if it was written on Mars. It was totally different to what you spoke about. So I think the provision of draft plans so you can check it before you get your plan is a good development. I think the other thing that, that needs to be done, I mean, it's it's great for people to, to read a manual and understand what the manual says that they're allowed to, to allow for in a plan, um, but to have planners and have, um, you know, some of the bureaucrats actually go into the services, actually meet with the clients, understand significantly what your challenges are. So really get down to the detail and I think, you know, no one person uh, is the same as the next. So trying to really understand it, like you said earlier, Denise, getting people to Nardi House to actually understand the difference of change like they've made to some of those plans, actually what that actually means, not only for your service, but uh, for the participants so that they can see firsthand what those issues are with you. Um, uh, I always find if you have a first-hand experience of something, you're less likely to, to fall back on the, oh, but you know, it says I can do this only, or I can only put this in. And that's my frustration at times with um, bureaucracy. Uh, we'll go to uh, Karen Mills now, who wants to, to share an experience with us before we go to Maria Irwin. Yep. Muted us. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Karen Mills from Queanbeyan Children's Special Needs Group, and I've got Kelly with me. So. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity today. We just wanted to talk to, to you about some of the things that we've found with dealing with the NDIS and some of this is just following on what you, with what you've been talking about. Um, so the inconsistency in funding that is received by the participants, depending on who the planner is. Um, we noticed this with each who does the planning for children under seven and also with uniting when they're over seven. So um, there's an, also an inconsistency in information that's received in response to questions when you ring the NDIS. There's a bit of a, um, people sort of say, well, you just keep ringing back to get the answer you want <laughs> because it's so inconsistency. So that's, you know, relates to what you've been talking about in regards to the training that that they have. Sometimes it can take multiple calls to get the help that you actually need. So it, it, I don't know if it's a training issue, but it seems to be that whenever I ring NDIS, the person that I talk to first generally does not have a clue. And I spend most of my time on that phone call trying to inform them of, of the, 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 what they should already know. The other thing we find is that um, once it, it's quite, it seems to be quite easy for children to get on the NDIS when they're younger than seven, but once they turn seven, if they don't have a diagnosis, and some of our children don't, haven't, haven't ha had a diagnosis yet, it's really hard to get the NDIS funding then or nearly impossible, um, even though they've still got needs and, and high needs. So, that's another barrier that we're finding for some families. We've also had families that are from um, 
that have missed out on getting the NDIS because of the fact that they're then from non-English speaking backgrounds and it's just really hard for them to navigate the system. Like um, hard enough to navigate if you are an English speaking person, but it's nearly impossible to navigate if English is your second language or if you don't speak it at all. Yeah. That's definitely some of the frustration that we've seen uh, around the paperwork and um, I, it beggars belief in 2020 that we still require, you know, reams of paperwork um, when generally the, what people need to know are on the first three pages of any form. Um, and this is the problem we have um, right across a whole range of sectors is that every time you ring, you're required to either retell your story or, or reacquaint the, the, uh, the person on the other end of the line about your situation or why you need support or the, the shortcomings in the support you receive, you're receiving. Um, and then generally you're sort of shunted from place to place until you find somebody that, that knows the system well enough to be able to assist you. And look, that's not a criticism of, of the people on the phone. It's a criticism of how we've set up the system. Um, and we need to be able to do that better and make it easier, streamline, streamline processes for people. Um, and you can see why people end up super frustrated on a phone line um, and usually blow their top because after 20 minutes, when you've already spoken to three different people and told the story three times, um, you know, you still, not, you still don't have an answer. So, look, I, I think they're just, we, we have to work out a, a simple system for people, a, a bureaucracy that, that is easier for people to navigate. And you're right, um, if we're having trouble doing that, um, there are people from non-English speaking backgrounds or Indigenous people um, who are going to have more trouble with the system. So we need to be able to, to make that easier for people. And look, I, I don't think that there's a, a simple, you know, silver bullet for that one, um, but we do have to simplify and streamline our, our systems to make it work for the people that need it. Bill, your thoughts? Um, with special, with um, I'm interested in your experience with kids over seven and the diagnosis. I, I've got this concern, but maybe it's not real, uh, that some of the report writing already exists in the education system, but people are being asked to get new reports. And it just seems to me there's a fair bit of double handling in our special education system, and it's not the fault of the schools. But if you've already got a diagnosis, if you've already got assessments, sometimes I feel that the NDIA, because it's just part of the you know, procedures, will ask for duplicate reports. And then I worry that they don't get read. So I think going to Christy's point and yours about responsiveness, other than being able to use some of the educational data, um, timelines, you've got to have, a, you've got a reasonable expectation you get an answer within a set period of time. You've got a reasonable expectation that you get um, something in writing. The other thing I would say to you is uh, they're creating a bit of a prisoner mentality that you've got to spend, or a famine mentality that if you don't spend your package in a set year, you'll lose the margin you don't spend. The whole point of having packages was because you would use it more prudentially than large institutions. But if you're being told, if you're taught to uh, spend every cent you get in that 12 months, then you will spend every cent. But whether or not that's the best use and whether or not you, you know, that to me seems counterintuitive to the notion of choice and control. Thanks, Bill. Um, Maria Irwin. Um, I'm muted. Oh, right. Okay, I'm fine. My question actually goes back into relation with the education department and children that have been identified by the NDIS who have been long-term uh, made provisions for, the battle then goes um, into getting the support in the school because um, these two services don't talk to each other. That is an NDIS matter. This is a school matter. And 
there's a huge, massive frustration for me around that. Um, I must say that um, in the last 12 months, even though we have not spent our funding, we have um, got the best level of services and I'm uh, self-managed for my grandson. And it has been um, a really good experience. However, we're limited because we're regional, we live in a Batlo, um, all those things. I'm really happy. My question is relation to, I'm getting support for my grandson. I'm told there is funding at the school. There's no joining and there's no combined plan for his future travel with both those services. One hand doesn't know what the other hand's doing. Me, as his advocate, um, wants to know how the funding he, that he gets in the school is being used to benefit him. All those things are happening behind closed doors. Even though I must say the school is doing an amazing job, if you don't know what's happening, how can you ask? Mm. So that the integration between the, the education department and NDIS where you've got a, um, a participant uh, on a plan, um, but also still attending uh, local education facilities. What's the integration between them, Bill? I don't think there is a, a lot of integration. So you're right, Maria. I get that when I'm critical of how the NDA is operating, I don't want to go back to what it was before. And I get that it's made a step change. So it's a, people should just understand that again, that we are very supportive of the NDIS. We just think it could be better run and more empathetic. In terms of the schools, a lot of special schools, for example, um, are now writing the app, you know, working, they're almost doing a lot of the NDIS work in terms of helping families apply for grants. You know what I mean? But then we've got this rigid demarcation, which I didn't even see on a building site. You know, where you, as soon as you get to the school gate, it stops being an NDIS matter and becomes a school matter. I, I can tell by your non-verbal animation there, Maria, you agree. And um, um, what I think is that we can do a lot better there. I mean, special schools have got a lot of resources. And, you know, I remember visiting a school in the northwestern suburbs of uh, Melbourne. And they could run services out of hours, and but they've been told they can't because um, they're not people can't use their NDIS packages. Yet quite often there is a uh, a deep well of knowledge which would help some of the mainstream schools even, and kids could go there after hours. But there's just rigid demarcations. So I'd be very prepared to raise this with the parliamentary committee, and we don't even have to wait till the general election. We should start. We've got two resources not talking to each other, and instead individuals have got to make the linkages, which is a little silly. But I also think that problem, Maria, extends to hospitals, you know, and, uh, and a lot of service providers also encounter this problem. When your child is sick and doesn't go to school, the school doesn't lose the funding. They just wait till the child comes back. But in disability, if you're booked in for a day service for a year, um, if you can't go there, they lose the funding. So that's, that's that's not, I mean, you want to have individual choice and control, but that's absurd uh, because you've got fixed costs. And the same in the hospital system, that a lot of hospitals do an excellent job, but they don't fully understand disability. But if they have people with disabilities in their hospital wards, it takes, it's a very intensive resource issue, but you can't use any of your NDIS package for any support in the hospitals. Like it is a definition of absurd. So that's a really good point. Um, the next question is from Kim Hitchcock from Round Squared. She says, as a support worker, there are also concerns around participant specific training as a lot of people, um, a lot more people living with complex disabilities are now living in the community. Uh, is there going to be any uh, participant specific training to allow them to live within the, the communities that they want to be in? 
could, could I get um, Kim to pack any, unpack an example uh, or one of the participants here or people here to give us an example of how they think that might work? I mean, it makes sense to train the workforce and it makes sense in, to pay services to train the workforce because, of course, a lot of that stuff doesn't get covered in packages. The, the training, the, the non-FaceTime, but the equally important training time of the workforce. There should be a loading in packages to allow services and workers to get that knowledge. Uh, but I just wonder if you can give me an example. Yeah, just um, as, a, as a support worker working in the community, I work with a variety of different people with complex needs. Um, if my organisation trained me for every one of the, those needs, for every one of those um, people living with disabilities, um, I'd have really um, a real big, big bill, I suppose. And my question is, is, can there be a part of the NDIS that covers people living in the community with, client, with, with specific needs um, to allow them to access support workers that are more skilled, um, can provide a better service, can provide um, more dignity within the community, can allow people with more complex needs to stay in their communities, and also allow staff to have more flexibility and maybe even look at um, being able to decasualise the system a little bit. So people that work in disabilities are a real casual, as you know, it's become a real casual job. And in some instances, people that haven't got um, supported plans are, are still accessing support staff with no training, therefore putting lots of people at risk. Bill, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it does go back to something we said earlier. There's, there's no comprehension of the identity of the disability workforce. I mean, even in the uh, COVID-19, when we said there's got to be more PPE provided to disability workers, just the, the government just sort of doesn't get it. They said, well, if there's an outbreak, well, it's a bit late to provide the gear then. Um, so I use that as an example. This is why we need a workforce plan and disability. Labor's been pushing, and a couple of those conservative backbenchers are agreeing with us, that we need to get the, uh, we've got a parliamentary committee oversighting the NDIS. We've got to have a workforce plan. And there's got to be some loading in the price guide to allow the training of workers. I think the Quality and Safeguards Commission also is probably going to have to step up. There was the terrible case recently which came to light in South Australia where a lady called Anne-Marie Smith was, according to the reports, in her chair for a cane chair for a year. You know, it's where she would eat, sleep and, and toilet. And um, eventually she went to hospital and, and then she, passed, she died of sepsis. Um, there, were carers, there was a carer going in, apparently. Um, that's not how 99% of the disability workforce operate. But what's the accreditation checking? How do we know that when that the system does have that quality and that trained workforce? It all comes back to workforce, and the Safeguards Commission has to be more proactive. But the NDI can't say that's a disability service or a worker issue. They, they're the people with the checkbook. And that means that they've got to take responsibility for the overall quality of the system. It's such a big issue, Kim. Thanks. Uh, we have a phone question from Dave now. Um, we're going to uh, unmute you, Dave. Excellent. Thanks very much. You got my text, obviously. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm actually a participant in the NDIS, but I'm also on the Queanbeyan City Council um, Access Committee, so that's probably why I got invited. Um, look, as a person with vision impairment, one of the things that, that really bugs me about the NDIS is the LAC process, and somebody's already raised it. Um, I had a, I've had a couple of very, very bad experiences, and I just wanted to, to answer a question more than anything. Somebody said, why do we have to use an LAC? Do you know what? You don't. I took, I took the issue to the Ombudsman and they came back and said, well, for choice and control, you don't have to use your local LAC. So I've got a decision maker making my uh, decisions on my plan now. And lo and behold, my plan's worth a little bit more money. It's exactly what I want. And 
and it works. Um, unfortunately, the NDIS don't do that very well, but the um, but if you can get away from some of those processes where they, you know, oh, we've got um, a contractor doing something rather than a, a basically a delegate in a government department making a decision, um, somebody with a little bit of experience, we can get the job done. And I just wanted to raise that concern that there, there seems to be that the NDIS is set up um, to work for itself and for its processes rather than for me. Um, so getting rid of LACs, in my view, and I, you know, I don't want to can anybody, but if they're not working for us and they're not giving us the plans that we need, what are they doing there? And why, you know, as a taxpayer, that bugs me anyway. But also, um, as a person with a disability, how can it be that you can have an LAC who put a plan in and forget, in my case, they forgot my guide dog? You know, a blind man, his guide dog, and they forgot it. And that's why I, I went and got a, um, and got my own planning um, done through the NDIS. So. I just wanted to answer that question, but also raise with you my main concern with, with this whole process is that it's not geared up for us, it's geared up for the NDIA. Dave, um, thanks for that. And uh, I'm sorry, you also made a good point in an email that when we do these Zoom meetings, we need to make them more blind friendly. So thanks for that. We're, we're learning this technology as well, but I'll take it on board, appreciate the advice. Um, well, what you've said is what we've been saying, that the organisation seems to have become an organism in its own right, that it protects itself. Uh, it's spent a lot of money on consultants designing processes, I think just to cover their own backside. And uh, that wasn't the function of this organisation. It was to ensure that there's uh, packages of support provided to people and then give you the control over what you need. Um, so we agree, uh, the LACs, the original concept, the LACs 10 years ago, was to be case managers. We saw in the bushfires, ironically, in 2009, uh, in the Black Saturday fires, uh, when they were in Victoria, that a lot of people trying to deal with government departments and bureaucracies just needed a PA, um, uh, you know, a, a trained PA, a case manager that have, you know, maybe 15 or 20 families, and they just are there every week, just not doing everything for you, but just helping you. You've got one human being, you can ring up and you don't have to explain your story every time, not a new person. Uh, and they will just be, you know, there as much for your therapy, but just to just help you just not feel like you're a number. And these LACs just seem to be, in some cases, some of them are excellent, but some just become uh, double handling and you're just explaining stuff again and again. That's just profoundly irritating. Yeah, I agree 100%, Bill. Um, we are coming to the to the end of our session today, but uh, there are a couple of good points raised in the, in the chat that I just want uh, to allude to before we finish up. Um, Lynn Kerbin um, says that people in regional areas, um, we know that there's a, a gap with the NDIS because our geographical distances and our transport issues, uh, our smaller populations and our workforce issues mean that uh, our budgets uh, reduce uh, year on year and they, it gets harder and harder for us to get around uh, to get to the services that people need to get to. Um, getting a, the level of support and uh, um, access to, to build their skills is, is harder if people don't actually understand the challenges we have geographically getting to different services. Um, and Karen Mills, um, and this one I know a lot about, I have three kids in a range of different uh, sports and they've all been in daycare uh, at different points. Um, they can't charge a client when they cancel at 3 p.m. by 3 p.m. the day before the service is due to take place. Um, and therefore they lose funding. Now, if I enrol my kids in, you know, tennis for a, for a term, I pay for the term, regardless of whether they show up or not. Uh, same with daycare. If, if their days to go are Monday, Wednesday and Friday, and they're sick on one of the days or we're away or you, they can't go for whatever reason, you still pay for that day um, because there are costs associated with running the activity um, the admin side of that, the insurance on that, um, you know, the general cost of actually running a business, let alone um, the, the, the cost of just one child's 
uh, participation. So um, really good points from Karen and Lynn and, and hopefully um, uh, we can follow those up. Um, we've got we've got a, a fabulous shadow minister in Bill, um, somebody that supported this from the very beginning, um, and someone like me who definitely understands the challenges of geography, um, and that's one of the biggest challenges right across the Eden Monero is is the sheer size um, of our electorate and getting uh, access to some of these services um, is a is a huge problem for people. Um, Bill, is there anything you want to say before we wrap up for the morning? Listen, thanks everyone for helping inform both of us about what's important. We don't pretend to have all the answers and unfortunately we're the opposition. So you can talk about the problems and we can talk with you, but we can't just make things happen. We've got to lobby and push and argue, but this is important what you're doing. But what I really want to say to you in conclusion is I'm very committed to the best possible NDIS and indeed beyond that accessibility and a fair go for people with disability and their carers. But you can't make change just by writing a letter or, or indeed a Zoom meeting. You really do need to have representatives who are part of the change. And again, I know for some of you, politics just makes you annoyed and all of that, and I don't blame you sometimes, but you've got a quality candidate and you know, we, we need to get things done. And that means having representatives who are committed, not just to sorting out individual matters, but to making the whole system more responsive to people. So please encourage your other friends not to donkey vote and not to, you know, just go for any old candidate. But this is about voting to improve the circumstances of the people you love and work with and care for. So please vote. Thanks, Bill. Very importantly, the 4th of July is our by-election date. Um, thank you all for joining us today. We really hope um, you've had some questions answered and you've been able to, to give us some of your experiences, which always um, plays well to uh, have your representatives hear firsthand the experiences that you're having on the ground so that uh, advocacy is actually detailed to the experiences you're having. Um, thanks very much for joining us today, guys. If you have any issues or anything further you wish to raise with us, please get in contact um, with, my off, with, with my team or Bill's office and uh, we'll uh, try our best to get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks, thanks. very much, guys. See you later. Thanks, Sana. Thanks, Asa.